Hi there. Welcome to this expert interview as part of the massive open online course on terrorism and counterterrorism. Well, we're very glad to have with us today, Mr. Brian Michael Jenkins. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Brian is a senior advisor to the president at the Rand Corporation, and he's also director of the National Transport Security Center at the Mineta Transportation Institute. And he has authored over 200 publications uh, in the field of terrorism. So we're, again, we're very glad that you're with us today. And well, one of the core insights that you have shared with us already in the 1970s is that terrorism is theater. And you also wrote that terrorists want a lot of people watching and not a lot of people dead. Well, of course, we have to keep in mind this was against the backdrop of, for instance, the uh, attacks on the Munich Olympics. And this was quite an innovative insight back then in the 1970s. So maybe you can reflect a bit on how you think that has impacted our understanding of terrorism as a strategy. Well, and, no, it's a great question. But in order to understand uh, the terrorism as theater, uh, you have to go back to understand the origins of, of, of terror, uh, terrorism, at least in its contemporary form. I mean, uh, terrorist tactics, use of terrorist tactics grew out of frustration and failure on the part of uh, a number of movements in the 1960s. Uh, uh, first in, in uh, Latin America, groups that had uh, wanted to replicate the success of the Cuban revolution with rural guerrilla tactics uh, by the late 1960s had, had failed to do so, and therefore uh, looking for new approaches, moved into the cities where they adopted terrorist tactics. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, uh, the Six-Day War in 1967 in the Middle East demonstrated the failure of Arab armies uh, and therefore pointed out to the Palestinians that uh, in order to continue with their struggle, they had to find a, a different strategy. And no, so they began to adopt uh, international terrorist tactics, really uh, with advice from the uh, the Algerian uh, independence movement, which had been successful against France. And then the third component was uh, that in response to a, a resurgence of the so-called new left uh, protest mm -hmm. against the Vietnam War and inspiration coming from these urban guerrilla groups and, and uh, in, in Latin America and terrorist tactics in the Middle East, we saw the proliferation of, of little groups in, in the United States, in Europe, uh, in, in Japan, that imitated the terrorist tactics because the protest movements were, were not succeeding in the way that they expected. Now, because uh, terrorism has this modern origins in guerrilla warfare, there was a tendency to view it as a purely military strategy. This was another form of, of, of military strategy. Uh, when in fact, what the terrorists were attempting to do is by choreographing uh, dramatic acts of violence, they, they intended to attract attention to themselves and their causes and create fear and alarm that would cause people to exaggerate uh, their, their strength and the importance of their, their cause. Um, in other words, terrorism was as much, even more so a psychological mm -hmm. strategy as it was a military strategy. Now in a military strategy, uh, if you're looking at a military threat, of course you focus your intention, your attention on your, your adversaries uh, intentions and capabilities. That's what we assessed. Um, if you're thinking of terrorism as a psychological strategy, then you begin to, to focus not only on the terrorist actors and the scripts of violence that they write, but, but rather on the relationship between the actors and the audience. Mm 
and that led to trying to sum that up in a in a in a, in a yeah. short mm -hmm. phrase terrorism is aimed at the people watching terrorism is theater yeah thanks so also sharing the, the more the backgrounds and indeed the different views on on how we see terrorism but do you think that this idea of indeed it is a psychological strategy do you think policymakers or maybe even academics have have done enough with that insight in other words have we really focused then also closely on the role of these audiences, or have we still been stuck somehow with this this dominant view of terrorism primarily as a military strategy? What what do you think? Have we learned enough from this insight? I, you know, I think I think we have uh, probably uh, focused uh, over focused really on on the military aspects of this, and that's not uh, uh, that's easy to understand given. The nature of the events and 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 the escalation of terrorism uh, over the years, you know, culminating in the uh, the 9/11 attacks. Uh, so, in 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 the wake of, of of those attacks, there was a natural tendency to to say, "Look, what do we need to do in order to destroy these groups and stop them from carrying out uh, uh, this type of of violence?" Um, we certainly could do more. I think one area where that has changed, and it's and it's a fascinating area of, of current research, a lot of a, a lot of attention being paid to it, and that is the process of radicalization, where people are now looking at uh, how does the terrorist organization, the narrative, the ideology, affect the individual in response. So it's not so much the broader audience watching mm -hmm. this, but those who might then be radicalized uh, and re be recruited or recruit themselves uh, to the terrorist struggle. Okay, yeah. So more like on the individuals involved indeed, yeah. And, okay. and then indeed these, these studies into the, the audiences, and maybe you can share a bit more about what could the audience then also do in this strategy of terrorism? If we say, okay, the audience is, is crucially important, like what role is there for and who is the audience maybe? You know, I'm, I, let me come back to that because I, I, mm -hmm. I do want you, you raise a point here, which is really, now that I think about it, it, it is critical in, in terms of, of both the relationship between the terrorist uh, ideology, the group, uh, and uh, and its recruiting and its attempts to affect the psychology of a broader a broader audience. You know, I suppose we ourselves in the early days, even we, I, I know that I'm I'm guilty of of having missed things as a result of a mindset. I can recall in the late 1970s, we conducted a major research effort to identify the possible weapons that were coming into the arsenals of armies that might somehow, if they be used by terrorists, if terrorists were able to acquire those weapons. And, and so we looked at all of the all of the new weapons that were coming in. I mean, there were a number of weapons of concern. For example, uh, handheld uh, precision guided surface to air missiles, yes. which at that time were coming into the uh, in in the tens of thousands of, of weapons coming into the hands of, of armies. And of course, our great concern would be the possible terrorist use uh, of these uh, precision-guided uh, portable missiles uh, against commercial airliners so that they could begin dropping, mm -hmm. uh, dropping airplanes. So we went through this exercise, um, but we missed the fundamental technological development that was in a sense, the most important weapon of the terrorists. And that was the internet. Ah. It was then still in its infancy. But the internet, as it developed, um, had a crucial change, a fundamental change on, 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 on terrorism. Uh, it enabled them to communicate with uh, not only their, their followers, but uh, uh, with a much broader audience, without any editorial interference, yeah. they could do so directly. It enabled them to coordinate uh, operations internationally, so we could really see uh, 
uh, global enterprises uh, like Al Qaeda, like Islamic State, and and others coming into this, and it also had a fundamental change on recruiting. That earlier in the 1970s, when one joined a terrorist group, you went underground in a sense, and and before that group would allow you in, they 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 carefully vetted. Uh, the volunteers, because they were worried about infiltration by the authorities. They were worried about unreliable members uh, uh, com coming in. Uh, on the other hand, if you, re if you recruit by exhortation, that is exhorting people to do whatever they can, wherever they are, uh, you, you don't worry about quality control. It's sort of a wholesale strategy. Uh, and it led to a change in, in a sense, the profile of the terrorist uh, volunteers themselves. They were self-selectors, and indeed, many of them were, were troubled individuals who saw the ideology and the enticement and approval of violence as a conveyor for their personal discontents. And so that's been one of the fundamental changes yeah. that we have seen over the decades. Thanks. That's, that's also very interesting to, to hear. And it makes me wonder if you say it's more about their personal discontents and they, they find a way to maybe unleash that or release that, that kind of um, negative energy maybe that they have. Are they still as much focused, I would wonder, then also on this audience or is for them in itself that's what some people uh, say as well now right this ego terrorism it's more about the individual just acting or being violent rather than achieving these these um, uh, more indirect goals so would you think that has also changed then how how they see terrorism and the role of the audience or would you say that that's still the same but it's attracting a different kind of people no i i, I think you're you're absolutely right it 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 has changed in many cases the, the quality of the the individuals and how they how they view it. We're seeing an, an increasing uh, uh, volume of what can I call them untethered terrorists. That is, they're terrorists and they they may subscribe to a particular ideology although they tend to shop ideologies. In other words, there was, a, there was a book written many, many years ago, a brilliant book by Eric Hoffer called The True Believer. And, and he said there was a personality type that uh, embraced extremist causes, uh, but it was, it was within the personality of the individual and therefore they could shift from cause to cause and whatever cause they happened to adhere to they had they adhered to the most extreme um, manifestation of that cause. So there was a true believer type. Uh, what we are seeing are individuals who, um, again, use the ideology as a conveyor for not only their own discontents, but as an advertisement for their existence. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, in a competition with others for a score that will elevate them yeah. uh, in a pantheon of in a pantheon of terrorists, and and so in a sense, these are these are mass murderers with manifestos, yeah. <laughs> um, and and you know whether it's it, it's 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 uh, on on YouTube or you know whether they have a a, a GoPro camera on their on, on on their head when they when they carry out these attacks, uh, these are these are in a sense competitive and and if with it, it almost becomes a, a a kind of a an atrocious video game, except it's not a game. It's yeah. it's, it's real life carnage. Um, but, you know, it, it carries the message beyond the ideology, it carries the message, I kill, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're seeing, we're seeing more of that. Yeah. And, and do you think that indeed this, yeah, will this continue to, is this a temporary wave of more individualistic 
forms of terrorism or, or do you think this will actually continue for the next decades i mean you've you've studied terrorism for also uh the past few decades so maybe yeah what are your expectations i know it's always hard you don't have a crystal ball of course but do you think yeah is this a temporarily development or could this be more long lasting well you know um i i always when people say you've studied this for for so many decades i have to apologize you know yes i've been studying this for decades give me another 30 or 40 years i'll have it all sorted out um <laughs> and I, Fair enough. I don't think we call you back think, in a few decades so. <laughs> I, I i don't think i don't think yeah. that uh, i don't think we're going to solve the the problem i mean um i think it's safe to say that terrorism in a variety of forms is going to continue in some cases we do have more more disciplined groups that are waging uh, struggles that we can clearly identify i think increasingly they coexist with uh, these these individuals who simply fasten themselves onto these causes and and carry out individual acts of violence which are meant more to satisfy their own their own personal needs and and uh, uh, than advance the cause of a particular group. Uh, we see a third concurrent phenomenon taking place, and that is the in increasing incidence of what might simply be called um, random social aggression, random mm -hmm. social of violence. Uh, these, are, these are attacks, they're carried out um, you know, in in public places and train stations and in in tube and subway stations, uh, and so on. Not because they have anything to do with transportation, but these are venues where strangers come together. Uh, they're they're not connected with traditional ordinary crime. These are not armed robberies. Uh, often there is no political or ideological nexus. This this just represents a a population, mm -hmm. uh, especially a post pandemic population that is increasingly uh, on edge, quick to violence, and and so the 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 problem we face right now is that we have the continuation of terrorism in its more traditional forms, we have this sort of atomized, individualistic terrorist uh, uh, terrorist violence, individual actors. And then we have this sort of just random, mm -hmm. unconnected, unprovoked um, social violence in, in increasing. Uh, and I think the latter two of those, that is the, the individuals who carry out these attacks for, for very personal reasons and this random social violence, are much broader societal problems mm, yeah. than our initial focus, which was, you know, terrorism carried out by organized groups aimed at achieving uh, specific political objectives. Yeah, great. I think that's also a good remark to, to see, okay, as you said, also in the 1970s, we still might have had this image of what was before as more military strategy, and now we're maybe stuck still this, this idea of terrorism only being a group-based thing, very disciplined, whereas we also see new forms, as you say, emerging. Although, as you also say, like some forms we might now label terrorism, but maybe we can question if we should label it. You, you didn't call it terrorism, right? The last group. You said more like no. social. Yeah. No. And and here's where we have to be careful. Again, going yeah. back to the 1970s. Uh, in, in the 1970s, um, really uh, what we referred to then as international terrorism. This is terrorist groups uh, hijacking airliners or sabotaging airliners or kidnapping or murdering diplomats, uh, blowing up embassies. Um, the the concern of, of the international community at that time was not that the international community was going to intervene in each one of these local contests. So it wasn't it wasn't a matter of international concern, I want to say concern, but international uh, responsibility. 
to, to intervene in urban guerrilla warfare in Argentina or Uruguay or Brazil or to sort out, you know, the, the, the contest between the IRA and, and, and the United Kingdom. Um, those were within the domain of individual national responsibility. What the world was concerned about was, in a sense, this violence spilling over into the international domain, again, in the form of hijackings, attacks on uh, diplomats or diplomatic facilities, um, or a, a group going abroad to carry out an attack in another country. Um, in order to deal with an international problem, uh, it, it really there had to be an international consensus as a prerequisite for cooperation. That in turn required a very precise definition of terrorism. It's not that there was no definition of terrorism in the 1970s. There were probably a hundred definitions. Yeah. Yeah. And and so we were all over the place. In order then again to focus and to get a consensus, an international agreement, it required that we very precisely define it. Um, and it, it, it um, however, in doing so, we, I think, became really obsessed with, mm. with definition, with having a a very precise taxonomy that that we could yeah. that we could could look at. Um, I mean, and and in a sense, definition became kind of the the Bermuda Triangle of of terrorism research. I mean, I've seen entire conferences uh, struggle with the the definition of terrorism yep. and disappear to never be heard from again. Um, and, and we still tend to do that today. There is a phenomenon of, of terrorism to be sure. It is a complex one. There is, as I say, these parallel uh, phenomenons of individual uh, apparently ideologically yeah. motivated violence, but it's as much individual as it is ideological. And then there are these other societal problems and, and they are different, but we ought to in our own in our own research in in looking at these not try to confine ourselves to say well we are going to only look at this mm. narrow narrow slice that meets our criteria as a terrorist act i'm not saying that we should be uh, uh, um in a sense sloppy uh, uh, about how we define what we're, we're doing but we ought not to so limit ourselves that we miss some of these mm -hmm. other some of these other developments. Yeah, and a tendency to to really just want to control it or have some some sense of control over it by defining it clearly. We indeed we might miss so much. Uh, yeah, that's a good appeal for also maybe intellectual flexibility to think a little bit outside of of the boxes that we we sometimes rigidly establish. Okay, well, thanks so much for sharing your insights um, with us and with the audience of this uh, online course. Uh, for those watching at home, if you want to know more about the work of uh, Mr. Brian Jenkins, well, we have listed a number of publications after this video, so you're welcome to check it out. And for now, thank you so much, Brian, for being with us. Thank you for the terrific questions. Thank you.